Republicans. In just seven days, GOP voters could hand Ron Paul a victory in Iowa. And that has some Republican elites very worried. Last week, we showed you some questionable excerpts from newsletters bearing Paul's name written over 20 years ago. Statements like, quote, order was only restored in Los Angeles when it came time for blacks to pick up their welfare checks. Another quote, quote, if you've ever been robbed by a black teenaged male, you know how unbelievably fleet of foot they can be. Another quote. I think we can safely assume that 95 percent of black males in Washington, D.C. are semi-criminal or entirely criminal. Paul says he didn't write any of that and even denies reading the newsletters. But back in the 90s, Paul thought the newsletters were a key part of his political machine. I deliver babies for a living, but I also okay. do a, uh, an investment letter. It's called the Ron Paul Survival Report, expressing concern about surviving in this age of big government. I also put out a political uh, type of uh, business investment newsletter. It sort of covered all these areas, and it covered uh, a lot about what was going on in Washington. And in 1996, Paul told the Dallas Morning News that he was not a racist and said he was not evoking stereotypes when he wrote the columns. He said they were being taken out of context. Ron Perl's uh, surge to number one in Iowa has brought new attention to his record and to what his supporters believe in. Joining me now is Perry Bacon Jr., the politics editor of thegrio.com and an MSNBC contributor, and Bob Franken, a King's featured syndicated columnist Thanks for both of you joining me tonight. Perry, can Ron Paul really deny uh, that he knew what was in these newsletters? It's one thing, and all of us in public life may have said things that we had to apologize for that was distorted. But to say you have no knowledge, didn't read it, and then people can now come and have you saying that these were part of your machine and that you were taken out of context. Well, even if you were taken out of context, you acknowledged that you had read them. How do you in 96 say, take the whole thing in context, and in 2011 say, I don't even know what you're talking about? Reverend, I think he can't do this. One thing about Ron Paul's always been known for being straightforward, honest. He has views people don't agree with, even a lot of Republicans don't agree with about, about war and about government, but he usually is known for being candid and honest. In this case, he's, his stories don't seem quite consistent, and I think this does take away from him from his political brand in a lot of ways. Now, uh, ironically, Bob, nobody uh, less than Newton Leroy who has called, uh, 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 said a few racially insensitive things himself in this campaign. He had this to say about Ron Paul. You look at Ron Paul's total record of, of systemic avoidance of reality, and you look at his newsletters, and then you look at his ads. His ads are about as accurate as his newsletters. Now, also, Bob, before you respond, Ron Paul on Fox News Friday defending the statements on his newsletter. I think the charge, which could be a correct charge, is I was pretty negligent as a publisher of a newsletter, not paying more, more attention. In many ways, uh, what they're trying to portray me as is exactly opposite of what I am, but I don't think it'll stick. Now, so he's saying the only thing he was was a negligent publisher, despite the fact there's tapes, and I played them, where he said that things were taken out of context, where he said this was a part of what he does. He delivers babies for a living, but he has this political newsletter. I mean, come on, Bob. Well, first of all, I think we should note that this is possibly the first time in your life that you've held up Newt Gingrich as a shining example. No, uh, number I, one. as an example, it wasn't shiny, but go ahead. <laughs> well, in any case, uh, that you're expressing an agreement with him. Uh, there is such an implausibility, uh, translate probably lying, uh, to somebody having no knowledge whatsoever that this kind of, you call it questionable material, I think it's unquestionably hateful, uh, was going out in his name 
name, that we really just have to sort of shove that aside and uh, really have uh, form some opinions about his credibility. But there is also a danger, as the New York Times pointed out today, Paul consistently refuses to disavow those yeah. groups that do believe in that kind of thing. And what that means is, is that uh, they get some encouragement. He's in effect making a deal with them to make them players in our system. That's kind of a Faustian deal uh, that he's making, but it's very dangerous. And if I may, let's not underestimate the danger of this kind of thing. We have a society right now that is angry, and it's a society that for many reasons is angry about the way the economic system is going and how certain people have manipulated it. And a lot of people want simple answers about who it is they should be angry about. So now, this is going to resonate a bit if you think about the history. We've got people of color, right. we've got Jews, we've got homosexuals, gays, that kind of thing. And what does that remind you of? Go back a generation and you'll have your answer. Well, Le, Le Perry, he uh, attacked uh, Dr. King uh, in these newsletters. Israel, let me show you some of the quotes. Uh, Martin Luther King, the world-class philanderer who beat up his paramours. Israel is an aggressive national socialist state. The AIDS patients should not be allowed to eat in restaurants because AIDS can be transmitted by saliva. This is all in the newsletters. But going to Bob's point, which is more disturbing or as disturbing, is some of his extreme supporters. Uh, New York Times reported, uh, as well, first let me show you Stormfront, which is a white supremacist group, Militia of Montana, uh, American Free Press, label a hate group, by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the New York Times, when questioning uh, Paul about this, they reported on Friday that uh, he said to them, quote, if they want to endorse me, they're endorsing what I do or say. It has nothing to do with endorsing what they say. So in many ways, he is not, he's refused to uh, repudiate their endorsement, which brings them into the mainstream of these primaries, something that President Obama and other major presidential candidates has not been allowed to do. I don't when, think Ron Paul will were questioned. I don't think Ron Paul will be allowed to do these things either. I don't think he's going to win. If he wins in Iowa, I don't think he'll win in any other state. And I think you're right. I mean, the people who support you do say something about you, which is why, which is why President Obama repudiated his pastor and his former pastor and a mentor to him last time. Who supports you and what they say does say something about you. And I'm surprised he's not taking the time to disavow the, these supporters. I'm actually surprised he's doing, they're not doing that. And I think it would help his campaign if he did. Now, Bob, how worried are the elites and the establishments of the Republican Party that Paul might actually pull Iowa off? Well, they seem to have so many things to worry about right now. They're worried about Newt Gingrich. Uh, surely they're worried about Ron Paul. Uh, they're worried about the fact that he could gain some traction in Iowa. We have a country that uh, really has two competing instincts going on at the same time. We have all the beautiful egalitarian instincts that have been widely discussed uh, as the shining, you know, the shining beacon that uh, the United States can be. But there's also always an ugliness that's uh, there to be uh, tapped and. Uh, you have a Ron Paul and some of his supporters, at least back in time, who were going after that. And it's a very potent force. I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Iowa votes and how it reflects one or two of those instincts. Perry Bacon, Jr. and Bob Franken, thank you both for joining me tonight.